Thank you for worshiping with Crossroads Nazarene Church. For more information about Crossroads, please visit our website at cvcrossroads.com. There you can find out more about our church, online giving, and small groups. You can also find us on Facebook at CV Crossroads, where we will be reaching out to our community throughout the week. Well, good morning. Great to see you today, and wonderful time to be alive, isn't it, when it comes to serving the Lord. We have so many opportunities, so many opportunities to, to represent Him to other people and in a world that, is, that really is searching in so many ways trying to find the, the answer that, that we know that we find in Jesus Christ. So, so I'm excited about being here today and uh, sharing this message. Well, in the, in the month of January of 2022, these first four weeks, we've been looking at a message series titled Courage, just looking at what courage is. And today I want us to look at what it means to apply courage to our commitments, having courage to commit. In life, we become whatever we are committed to. We are shaped by the commitments we make. When we think about the distinction between those who are considered to be ordinary and those who are considered to be great, it really is, comes down to this. Great people are just ordinary people who've made a worthwhile commitment to a cause greater than they are. That's really what boils down to what greatness looks like. That means that nobody then is naturally great. We're all just normal, ordinary people. But normal, ordinary people become great men or great women of God when we commit to something greater than ourselves. We need something bigger than ourselves to live for. We need something which draws us out of ourselves and, and brings out greatness in our lives because we become what we commit to. Well, this issue of commitment poses an immediate problem for many people. As you probably have observed today, a lot of people are afraid of making commitments of any time, of any type. There, there are many who don't want to commit to anything. For a lot of people, life is kind of like a buffet restaurant, sim similar to something like Golden Corral or something like that. But the fear of commitment comes when they wonder if there might be something better a little bit further down the road. And so, and so they stand in front of the salad area in that buffet line at the first of the buffet and they think, well, man, I don't know if I want to fill my plate up with, with, with this because down the road there may be something better. So they move on and down, down the next uh, set of, of items there are vegetables. And same thing happens. They look around and say, well, I don't necessarily want to fill my plate all the way up with veggies because there's something, maybe something down the road that's better. So they move next over to the, to the meat section and, and man lie, there's all kinds of meats there. And, and they go, yeah, but I don't want to fill all of the, everything up here because there might be something better down the road because down the road a little bit more is the, is the, uh, is the dessert section. So they move down to the dessert section and, and the desserts don't look that great either. And because they're not willing to commit to, to the food before them, they get, kind of get to the end and they don't have anything on their plate because they're afraid to commit to any of it. Yet we cannot make life uh, effective without making some commitments. You cannot rent or buy a home without commitment. You can't drive a car. You can't get married. You can't even have a job without making commitments in, in your life. So commitments define our lives. The key is to make fewer bad commitments and to make more good commitments. The Bible talks about commitments. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 6. It says, give yourselves completely to God. And that's a commitment right there. Every part of you. For, for you have been brought back to life and you want to be tools in the hands of God used for His good purposes. This is the most important commitment we can make our, in our lives, and that is to give ourselves completely to God to be used for His good purposes. Today, I want us to discover how five of our greatest needs and deepest needs in life are met by five great commitments that we can make. God's Word teaches us that we cannot fulfill God's purposes for our lives all by ourselves, all alone. God created us for community. 
we're made for relationships. We see this clear back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, where God said, it is not good for man to be alone. This is not a reference simply to God's reason for creating woman and also for the institution of a marriage between a man and a woman. God is saying that every person needs relationships in life, meaningful nurturing relationships. We need a spiritual family because there are many things that we can do and can only do and only learn by being with other people. So let's look at five great commitments that meet my five greatest needs. The first great need that we have, or one of the first great needs we have, is to strengthen our faith. I want to strengthen my faith. And the commitment associated with that is, I must unite with others in worship. I must unite it with others in worship. One of our greatest needs is to be strengthened in our faith. To strengthen my faith, I must unite with others to worship. Although worship certainly is to God and is for God, at the same time, it brings many benefits to us personally. Let's look at just two of those benefits. Uniting with others in worship, first of all, it renews our faith, but second, it restores our joy. We see this truth in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, where it observes, Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. How many times has this happened to every one of us? We roll out of bed on a Sunday morning and we say, Man, I'm so tired. I really don't have energy to go to church. I don't have energy to, to, to go to worship today. And yet, we decide to go anyway. And, and afterwards, when you come out and you go home, you go, man, I'm, I'm more energized and encouraged than I, than I expected. I think that's happened to every one of us. And the reason for that is because worship renews our strength and our faith in God. A few years ago, when I was recovering from surgery, I missed about eight weeks of worship, eight Sundays. That was a long eight weeks, uh, especially Sundays were, were very long, that day in particular. Well, so what did I do? Well, I, I watched worship services on TV, and it was okay watching those worship services, but I discovered it really didn't renew my strength like worshiping with my church family. Well, during that, those eight weeks, I also watched golf on Sunday, which solidified my opinion that watching golf on TV is about as enjoyable as watching paint dry. And so uh, it didn't renew my strength watching golf on, on Sunday. I also watched professional sports. It didn't renew my faith. I watched Sunday morning political talk shows. That kind of destroyed my faith. It made me depressed. It didn't renew anything. So God says, though, that when we wait on Him, when we worship Him, we are renewed. It recharges our, charges our faith and restores our joy. That renewal comes from the Word of God. It comes from music and fellowship and prayer, because all of these are part of waiting on God and receiving renewal from Him. So to strengthen my faith, I commit to unite with others in worship. A second great need we have is to discover my identity, our identity and purpose. And the commitment we make to fulfill that need is, I must connect with others in fellowship. We discover our identity and purpose in life as we fellowship with others. If we think about that for a moment, it makes total sense because we learn who we are in relationship. We, we learn who we are in community. None of us learn really what we are and, and what we are good at all by ourselves with, with no one around to give any kind of feedback. So the Bible says we need to be connected to God's family. We need to be connected in fellowship with the body of Christ, which is one of the phrases the Bible uses to describe the church. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 5. It tells us, We are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from Christ's body as a whole, not the other way around. Each of us finds our meaning and function as part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? We understand that our ears only hear as they are connected to the body. Our nose is only able to smell connected to the body. Our eyes can see only when they are connected to the body. This is obvious to us. We understand that. The body 
or the purpose that God created us for can only be discovered connected to the body, connected to the body of Christ. If you're not connected to the body of Christ, what happens if we choose to be disconnected is we wither. We wither spiritually. Just like a finger or a toe or a hand disconnected from the body will wither and die. And our connection and fellowship with others in the body, in the midst of that, we are called to a very important role. And that is we are called to be peacemakers. We're called to be peacemakers. Have you noticed in your life that, that when you are in conflict with somebody, it makes your whole life stink? It just makes your whole life stink. Everything else could be going fine. Everything else could be going wonderfully. But, but if you're having a conflict with somebody and they criticize you or they betray you or reject you, all of a sudden, no matter what good things are taking place in your life, your life stinks. Once we accept Christ into our life, God calls us and wants us to become reconcilers. He wants us to be people who create and nourish harmony instead of conflict. The Bible calls this the ministry of reconciliation. For every Christ follower, part of God's purpose for us is to make relationships better. For us to be instruments of peace and Christ-like love in place of the discord and conflict that can be so prevalent. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this, Christ brought us together through His death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace and that was the end of the hostility. So the ministry of reconciliation allows us to fulfill two very incredible purposes God has for us. First, God wants us to be ready for heaven. He wants us to be reconciled with Him. But second, as far as it depends on us, God wants us to be reconciled with everybody else as well. Let me ask, how desperately do we as Christ followers need to be pursuing God's purpose for us as ministers of reconciliation? I ask that question because I know we look around and we observe that our country and our world in so many ways is so incredibly splintered and segregated and in conflict. An example of this is, is racial, racial tension in our country. It's not declining, it's on the rise. And it just seems that it's white versus black versus Hispanic versus Chinese versus Middle Eastern persons and whatever nationality also which might be involved. But God is calling his people, his, his people to the forefront. And he is saying there is one place where everyone is welcome no matter where they are from or who they are. And it is the body of Christ. You will be loved and invited into fellowship. A third great need that we have is the need to develop our potential. And accompanying that need is a commitment to meet it, and it is that I must learn from others to grow. When we think about it, there are many things in life that we will never learn all by ourselves. There are things we can only learn in relationship with other people. This is one of the reasons why small groups is a, is a core value at, at Crossroads Church. If, if you're not connected in a small group on Sunday or sometime during the week, there are some things that you will be missing out of in your life. There are some things that we can only learn in relationship with a small group. Let me give off just a number of quick things that this would, that, that, that would be the case of. First of all, we can only learn forgiveness in relationships. We don't learn forgiveness all by ourselves. We only learn loyalty in relationships. We don't learn, learn loyalty just by being alone. We, we can only learn love in relationships. You, you can't learn that on your own. And there's things like kindness and faithfulness and, or unselfishness. We don't learn those without other people. Notice with me that, that the most important things we need to learn in life require that we be in relationship with others. And where's a, a fantastic, in fact, probably the best place to do that? It's in the family of God, in the body of Christ, in His church. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, we are told, Christ's body is fitted together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. Look at that word, grow. Significant word. We help each other grow. 
I help you grow, you help me to grow. The people on the, who are sitting, if you're in church and are sitting next to you in, in that church service, they need you and you need them to grow. God wired us all that way. There's a book that came out uh, a number of years ago. The book is about a well-known phenomena in psychological study. It is called the imposter phenomenon, which is defined this way. A lot of very successful people in life have wealth and power and good looks and fame and all of those kinds of things. Yet inside, they are incredibly empty. They feel hollow. They feel unfulfilled. And the title of the book is, If I am so successful, why do I feel like a fake? The answer to that question is, success was never meant to fully satisfy you. Because success is not enough in life to do that. We are taught from a very early age, from early childhood, that if we will just get successful, that we are going to be happy. The problem with that belief system is very simple, and that is it simply doesn't, true, uh, d doesn't work and it's not true. When, when people are successful, they don't feel happy because success is not enough to fulfill us. Rick Warren from Saddleback Church in a teaching series titled 40 Days of Purpose, teaches that there are three levels of living. There is the survival level, a second level is the success level, and the third is the significance level. Most of the world lives at the survival level, at least physically. In America, however, very few, if anyone, actually lives at that level, and the reason is because our society has a safety net for the poorest of the poor. So very few, if any of us, are living at a physically, uh, survi at the survival level physically, not knowing where our next meal is going to come from, where we're going to sleep, or not having enough clothing to keep warm. But on the other hand, there are an awful lot of people who are living at the survival level emotionally, stressed out all the time, hating their job, just putting in their time at survival level emotionally. Most Americans today are living at the second level, and that is the success level. This level is where you've got enough money or resources to have options. Success does mean that we have options that we do not have if we are living on the survival level. And the more successful we are, the more options we will tend to have. But that success level does not fulfill us because we were created by God for more than success. God created us to live at the third level, and that is the significance level. Where does significance come? It comes from giving my life away for something greater than myself. So to develop our potential, we must learn from others to grow. The fourth great need that we have is to experience significance. And the commitment we make to fulfill this need is to serve with others in ministry. Serve with others in ministry. Now I know that ministry can be a puzzling word, so let me give you a very simple definition. Ministry means to reflect Jesus Christ by doing good to other people. To experience significance in life, I must serve with others in ministry, because together we will team up to do good to others. Significance does not come from status. A lot of people think, well, if I just drive a certain car, then I'm significant. Or if I have a certain logo on, on my shirt or on my dress, I'm significant. That's not what makes a person significant. It does not come from the big three in our culture about what they consider to be significant, and that is status or salary or sex. But significant comes from one thing, and it's none of those three. That one thing is in serving. God wired us in such a way that we can only experience significance in our life when we give ourselves away. That's why it is impossible for us to be selfish and significant at the same time. Significant comes when I stop thinking about myself and start thinking about others, and I give my life away. The Bible says it like this in 1 Peter chapter 4, Each of you has received a gift to use to serve others. 
This tells us that the talents and strengths and gifts that we have are not for ourselves alone. They were given to me to benefit you and others. Likewise, the talents and strengths you have were not given to you by God to benefit just you, but to benefit me and to benefit others as well. God wants our lives to be significant, and serving others is the way to significance. Our example of significance is Jesus Christ, and here's what he said. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give your life for my sake and for the sake of the, of the good news, you will find true life. Jesus tells us there is no such thing as insignificant service. So serving doesn't have to be flashy to be significant. Every week, I think of those who are here at the church facility for, for a couple of hours. They prepare our facility for worship. And we have to acknowledge there's not too much flashy about emptying trash cans and cleaning restrooms and vacuuming and setting up chairs. But it is very significant. And Jesus says that no ministry is more significant than another because it all has to be done for us to be effective, as effective as possible. There's no such thing as an insignificant ministry. And Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 25. He observes, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did it for me. The words that, when Jesus said these words, it was an application to a lesson that he had just been teaching to the people. He, he said it this way. He said, one day, he said, we're going to stand before him, or before God in heaven. And God is going to say to us, you know what? Good job. Good job, because I was hungry and you fed me. And, when I, and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was sick and you, and you helped me to get well. I was in prison, you visited me. I was freezing cold and you gave me clothes. And we're going to respond, what? Um, what do you mean, God? I don't remember doing that for you. When, when did I feed you or clothe you or help you or visit you and, and all that? And Jesus says that he will say, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. So to experience significance, I must serve with others in ministry. And then number five, one of the great needs we have is to make an eternal difference. And the commitment that accompanies meeting that need is, I join with others on mission. God has a mission. He has a purpose for our lives but we will only fulfill it with the team week work of others. After his resurrection, and just before he went to heaven, Jesus had some last words. You probably noticed that last words of people are often very important. And the last words of Jesus are called the Great Commission. Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you. Follow me with this for a moment. God has a purpose for all of history, and God has a purpose for each of our lives. Well, God's purpose for our life is totally connected to His purpose for all of history. What is God's purpose for history? God is building a family. That is the whole reason He created earth. He wanted a family. On earth, that's God's family, and it is called the church. It's also called the kingdom of God. And when everyone possible has had the opportunity to come into His family, then this phase of history will end. It'll be over. We will go into phase two, which is eternity. So on this earth, during this phase, phase one, God says our purpose in life here is part of his big purpose, which is taking the good news to everyone, building God's family. That means that we as a church called Crossroads, as we serve God, as we serve one another, as we serve together, we are going to be constantly on the prowl, the prowl to discover how we can be used by God 
to bring more people into his family. That is God's purpose for Crossroads in everything that we do. And the doors God opens for us are not going to be the same doors that he opens for other Christ-centered church families across our community and nation and world. But God's specific plan and strategy for Crossroads will uniquely fit us. Not only so, but God will not ask us to account for what other churches have done or have neglected to do. We as a church, as Crossroads Church, we have been given some unique opportunities. Opportunities to assist God's purpose of bringing more people into His family. This morning, I come before us as a church to place a challenge before us. This challenge is to you personally. If I could personalize it by calling you individually by name, that's what I would do. But it's more than a personal challenge. It is also a challenge to us as a body of Christ called Crossroads. The personal and corporate challenge is this. As your pastor, as the one who God led me to become your pastor on March 1st, 2003, and who now God has led me to step aside as your pastor after 19 years, I want to leave you with a challenge. In this challenge, I am asking you, in fact, no, I am pleading with you, I'm pleading with you to have courage to commit. I ask you to intentionally and faithfully discover a place of ministry within the body of Christ called Crossroads. I say that because if this is the church where God has brought you, you have a place of ministry and a place of involvement where you are uniquely qualified to enrich and to encourage other people. Please do not wait. Do not wait to take that courageous step of commitment. Crossroads most certainly is in a season of transition. But let there be no doubt, God has been actively engaged in this process of bringing a new pastor with, with gifts and strengths and talents that will, with your commitment, with your courage, it is most certainly going to allow Crossroads to become far more effective than any of us can ever imagine. Now we have noted five of the greatest needs every one of us have. And we have also seen that each of those needs will be fulfilled when we personally, and then when we as a body of Christ, have the courage to commit. I'd like to close this message in prayer together. So would you pray, pray this prayer with me? Dear God, I come to you with my greatest needs. I need to strengthen my faith. I, I need to discover my identity and purpose. I need to develop my potential, and I need to experience significance. I need to make an eternal difference. Your word tells me that each of these needs require me to choose to have courage. Courage to commit in order for those needs to be fulfilled by you. So, Father, first, I commit the rest of my life to uniting with others in worship in order to strengthen my faith and restore my joy. Then I, I commit to reconnecting with others for fellowship. I, I commit to being a part of a, of a small group, to being an agent of reconciliation in the world and treating everybody with respect and dignity. And then, Father, I commit to learning from others, learning in order to grow, learning to become what you want me to be. Today, I also choose courage to commit by learning how to serve you by serving others in ministry. I will use and develop whatever those talents and strengths and spiritual gifts you've given me I'm not going to use them for myself, but for the benefit of other people. And finally, Father, somehow, some way, I ask you to provide me the courage to make an eternal difference. 
I know that that's only going to happen when I have built courageous faith into the commitments I make. So God, whatever you want to do through me, you have my permission. I commit my time and my talent and my treasure. I commit everything to you. Thank you that the commitment of my life to you is making an eternal difference. We bring this prayer to you today, Father, and claim it based on the promises of your word and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I want to thank you over the, this last couple of years with COVID. Uh, we went into the online message segment of ministry. And I want to thank you for participating in this. Some of you I've never met, um, but you've been an encouragement to me as some of the feedback has come on how God has used these messages to encourage and strengthen your faith. So as we look into the future, we're thankful for what God is doing. It's been a privilege to serve you in the name of Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Mm -hmm.